next two presentations. First, we will have the genocide roundtable number two, which is actually talking about what can we do, what can be done. And uh, we have a lot of people that we have already seen uh, today and listen also to, and uh, one new expert which joined. Um, the chair will be Mangzarni, and uh, we will have uh, on the panel Han Yangwe, the executive director of Euro Burma office, and then we have Andreas Schüller, who is uh, the director of the International Crimes and Accountability Program from the European Center for Constit Constitutional and Human Rights. And we have also Kylie Matthews, executive director of the, of the Montreal Institute of Genocide and Human Rights Studies from Canada, and Roli Kian, the Rohingya medical doctor and chair of the European Rohingya Council from the Netherlands. And last but not least, Mofidol Hock, director of the Center for the Study of Genocide and Justice from the Liberation War Museum of Bangladesh, who are going to talk about what can be done. Thank you very much. Um, OK, um, Professor Spivak um, said um, she doesn't have to leave at 6.30. So that gives us um, a one full hour. Uh, thank you so much for that. So. Um, their bios are in, in the, um, in the uh, program, so I won't waste any minutes. The way um, I'm going to chair this, I'm going to allow the, uh, each panelist to offer for eight minutes, short term, uh, immediate term, uh, and then long term solution. And I want them to address to one, basically three specific questions. The idea of um, uh, protected repatriation of Rohingya to protected homeland in Myanmar as part of the Burmese society. Yeah? And we're not talking here about separate state, republic, independence. And the, secondly, I want them to address the issue of um, I, uh, the call for ICC referral and how that will benefit or not benefit the Rohingya community and what they need. And thirdly, the, uh, um, what can we do as individuals who do not control the states? We don't have the institutional logic of states. We have the, uh, the, the humanity, we have the, that, that comes with compassion, we have the intellect, we have the social energy that ge gets generated by our own individual rage against injustices, in this case, Rohingya. So without further ado, may I ask that Carl Matthew to start and then we go this way, yeah? Eight minutes each. Yes, please, anyways. Thank you, Zarni, and uh, please call me out if I go over my eight minutes because I didn't time this in front of a mirror. Um, and I also, uh, working for an institute that came out, founded by survivors of the Holocaust, I think it's very important to be here today at uh, this museum, the symbolism of looking at the lessons of the Holocaust, but what can be applied today against mass atrocity crimes and genocide. Um, I think none of you would doubt about the ample evidence of atrocities committed in Myanmar, particularly since last August. We've seen different forms of atrocity crimes, uh, crimes against humanity, ethnic cleansing, and genocide, and they're all planned, and they're for us to see. And we have to ask, why haven't we seen as much action as we want to? Why is there no action to protect the Rohingya? And it's, it's interesting, because we have a multitude of states that have signed the Genocide Convention. And when there's concern of genocide, you're supposed to immediately act to protect and interdict that genocide, and also uh, work towards the prosecution of those perpetrators. And we also have, that hasn't been mentioned really at all at this conference, we have something called the Responsibility to Protect. This international agreement by states to act on their commitment to prevent mass atrocity crimes or to interdict them. It came out of the failure to stop the uh, genocide in Srebrenica and in Bosnia and also the failure to halt the Rwandan genocide in 1994 that had about 800,000 people killed in a three month period. So, so we have these laws and these normative frameworks that are being developed um, and signed on by many nation states. Why haven't we seen this action? Uh, I look at my country, Canada, and I can probably say for action for a country far away on the other side of the planet, 
that's not a global superpower, we've done pretty well. Um, part of the reason we acted or have, have tried to be more active in this, in, in helping protect the Rohingya, is in fact because Aung San Suu Kyi is an honorary citizen of Canada. And all of our honorary citizens, there's about six of them in total, they've all been great human rights leaders, but we've never had a, um, an honorary citizen who, who won the Nobel Peace Prize that went on to actually take control of a state that was committing genocide. So this has really inflamed Canadian public opinion and had a really uh, public pressure to do something. And our, our government actually has done some interesting things. For the first time ever, have appointed a special envoy for the Prime Minister to look at the Rohingya crisis. Never before have we had any massive humanitarian disaster or genocide where our top level government has actually appointed someone of senior political ranks to try to find solutions. And we've also just last week announced targeted sanctions against people in the Myanmar military. Canada has introduced something called the Magnitsky Act that we've uh, now worked with many states to actually go after individual citizens, people in government responsible for human rights. They've been deployed against Russia, against Venezuela, and also now against Myanmar. I think these are positive steps. But I think the, the real issue that we have to think about is that what we're looking at now, we need immediate action. The focus of the world and of civil society must be to pr protecting Rohingyas in Rakhine State now, right now. And we must hold our politicians to account. Yes, it's important that we help refugees. No one will deny that. It's important that we help Bangladesh deal with this massive refugee crisis. But I'm afraid we're dealing in a world where our leaders are failing to uphold international law. And it's easy for them to cut a check to the UN High Commission for Refugees, to cut a check to the World Food Program, and actually just pretend it's a refugee crisis rather than a genocide where we have to go to the source of the problem. So we have to, and we must raise our collective voices to shift the narrative away from the refugee crisis to the source of the problem, which is in Myanmar itself. And I'd like to point out, I think there's an, a wider danger here. Someone referred to it earlier, but there's a, a danger to Myanmar itself. When you start to kill parts of your society, it's almost like stabbing yourself in the chest. And countries that have committed genocide don't usually stop at one group. They go on. You can't trust a state that commits genocide. Countries that, that cannot or will not protect their civilians from mass atrocity crimes are not a stable neighbor to live beside. They're not a, a responsible member of the community. We have to keep an eye on this. And the biggest danger, too, is that Myanmar's actions could lead to a radicalization, not just the Rohingya, but a wider Muslim radicalization around the world, which is dangerous. People are talking about the clash of civilizations. Let's not make this happen. So there are always, for every reaction, there's a negative reaction. We have to remind the Myanmar authorities of that. And I really think that this conference must be a springboard for action and building political will. What can we do? I'm not in the, I'm not in the government, but I can use my influence to write op-eds, to write letters, to harass my politicians, to go after them on Twitter. There's lots of things we can do. And I think we need to think about some concrete measures. I think one thing we look at is that these economic sanctions have to be one of the immediate short-term things that we do. I just read today that the European Union is thinking about imposing um, uh, economic sanctions against the Myanmar military and individuals in the military. That's positive. We also have to look at travel restrictions. Cases where we stop mass atrocity crimes or prevented crimes lately, there's travel restrictions stopping authorities from being able to travel, particularly a shop or, or a holiday in the West or in the United States, can also have an immediate impact. We also must demand humanitarian access to Rakhine. This is now a running joke. The UN and Myanmar are on a collision course. And countries backing Myanmar, such as China and Russia, that have said they'd use their veto power to block any strong action by the UN Security Council to open up access to, to Rakhine State, they're going to be seen in the, um, in the history books as having a very, very lack of a moral conscience, if states do have a moral conscience. I'd also emphasize that a re repatriation deal cannot take place right now. As a former employee of the UN High Commission for Refugees, I can tell you this is not the time to send people back to, um, to Myanmar, to Rakhine. Their homes and villages have been destroyed, agricultural uh, fields have been destroyed or, or taken by the state. Um, we've seen Human Rights Watch this week showing that villages have been totally destroyed. Um, by, uh, by, by the authority, there is nothing for people to return to right now. So we cannot even pose that, and our diplomats need 
to refute that as a, as a durable solution to the plight of displaced Rohingya. Another important point, an arms embargo. We should not be selling arms to a country that's committing out atrocities against its own citizens. Even, well, they're stateless people, they're not their citizens, but according to international law, you're not allowed to treat them that way. Uh, and we have to do some more economic naming and shaming. Who are these people that are doing this? What countries are backing the Myanmar government? No country likes to be seen public. Why aren't we having people protest the Myanmar embassies around the world? We should, we should work at that. We should work with Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, get the, the people up together to show them that this is not going to die silently as they commit these crimes. And maybe we should actually put on every foreign embassy website, like the Canadian Global Affairs, Global, Global Affairs Canada, and put a warning for tourists going to Myanmar. It's now a big tourist destination. By the way, you're going to a state committing genocide against, your, against part of its population. Does that sound like a wonderful visit? Just recently, we had the Canadian ambassador to Indonesia, whose wife is the Canadian ambassador to Myanmar. Uh, he took a picture right around the Christmas holidays of him on a beach in Myanmar saying, oh, it's so beautiful here. And I think it was in Rakhine State. It's such a beautiful beach. The amount of public backlash of seeing an embassy official, a diplomat, an ambassador, vacationing in an area where a genocide is taking place was shocking. And the media actually picked up on it. So I think we need to think about all these things and actually assemble a civil society. And I'm going to end it here, but I want to say, I am not going to sit silent. I commit to work with everyone in this room, not to leave here as a conference. We're going to act on this, stay together, and build an international voice to protect the Rohingya. Thank you. Thank you again. Uh, there is no doubt that Myanmar has committed war crimes, crimes against humanity, and crimes of all crimes, genocide against our community, Rohingya community. To me, uh, the bringing of Aung San Suu Kyi into power is by design by the military so that the military can finish the unfinished job as uh, uh, put by the General Mi online. The military calculated that international community would believe what Aung San Suu Kyi says, dismissing and denying and they can finish their job of destruction of our community, whole community. So there has never been persecution of Rohingya to such extent than under Aung San Suu Kyi's watch. So as, as mentioned previous, uh, by previous speakers, Myanmar's genocide against Rohingya is at least 30 years old. United Nations is aware of this genocide long before anyone else. UN agencies are present in Rakhine State. I have been seeing them when I was very young. And uh, so a uh, very long time ago, international diplomats community is aware of this very long time ago. One by one, the diplomats have been traveling to Rakhine uh, Rohingya refugee camps, witnessing horrors Rohingya have been enduring. We start to feel that, if, uh, Roh that Rohingya um, refugee camps are like human zoo uh, for am amusement, yet they fail just because they are, they are strategic and ge ge because of their strategic and geopolitical interest. Many Rohingya start feeling that if we, you, we were not Muslim, with the West would intervene long before. How on earth Rohingya are persecu persecuted in such a scale in this 21st century? It is really unbelievable. As I mentioned earlier, international diplomats community is aware of this very long time ago, and uh, they have been uh, traveling to Rohingya refugee camps, witnessing horrors, and uh, that's the, we start to feel that, uh, you know, uh, like uh, I mentioned earlier. So Myanmar has PhDs in deceiving international communities, so please don't trust, uh, don't believe Myanmar military. As, uh, again, uh, the, uh, what should be done, what can be done? So uh, very urgently mobilizing humanitarian aid before monsoon comes. That, uh, that bring another devastation to Rohingya community in Bangladesh. This is uh, short term, very urgent. And uh, long, middle and long term, uh, the, uh, the helping us uh, uh, to build our community again from every aspect of life because Myanmar has destroyed us completely from uh, the, um, our uh, social infrastructure, religious infrastructure and everything. So, and uh, uh, help us to bring uh, the genocide perpetrators into international criminal court. 
So as an individual, so far, what the, the, our cause has uh, come to this extent because of uh, the individual activists, not because of diplomats, not because of any uh, the, the power. Individual activists, a scholar has been doing this. So this, uh, this Rohingya cause has been uh, coming to us to this extent. So every tweet, every Facebook post is, 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 is helping us a lot. So please help us individually and uh, with, uh, the, the, with the group and uh, as an organization and also the help us establishing a center to study and document genocide of the, our uh, Rohingya community, and also to have a protected homeland in our ancestral land so that we can live in peace. Thank you so much. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, so a number of points uh, from, from, from my perspective, uh, also a bit in relation to the European perspectives, um, which uh, were, were unfortunately, uh, we couldn't help the, the, the full panel. Um, and also responding to, to the questions you put. So, um, I mean, the first one on the ICC referral, um, I, I think that certainly should, should be something to include in a broader legal political strategy, um, but, but it should, shouldn't be the only one or the um, over, emphasized one because the ICC is, is, is one court with which it, it, its advantages and disadvantages um, without going into detail here and, and also with limited capacities. But it so, should certainly be one part in a lot larger strategy but not, not, not the only one um, also when it comes to uh, um, legal opportunities. And I think um, David Schaeffer already um, mentioned a number of um, other options here which should also form a part of a of a short and, and longer, mid and longer term um, um, legal strategy in addressing um, the issues at stake. And um, having said that, and, and that's the other point um, you mentioned with um, what non-state actors can do, what we can do, what um, civil society, um, academics and others can do. Um, from our experience uh, in the European Center for Constitution and Human Rights where I work um, in, in many different conflict areas, um, um, Victims-driven justice, as we call it, is often much stronger than inst institutional-driven justice. And that means that uh, where, where victims um, organize, where victims um, campaign, where victims also determine the, are trained and determine the legal and political strategies, um, in the long term they get um, um, more um, to, to some legal successes, but also beyond legal successes in really changing um, um, certain um, power dynamics. So that was in the Pinochet incident, um, um, visible in Chile, where, where it was really victims driven, driven going to Spain and then achieving his arrest. The recent Habre case on Chad, uh, which took place in Senegal, it's, it's another good example for victims driven 20 year long campaign achieving um, justice here and it, it still continues. Um, um, so that's certainly um, something from the experience that, that um, those groups can, uh, can achieve more um, in the long run than um, hoping that the international community will set something up and then it, it goes its way. So those voices are absolutely crucial here in, um, from, from the very beginning. And um, that's my third point, to get there, um, there are a lot of things that can be done already now. So one thing is to organize, to, to train, to practice on, um, not only on documentation, also on, on, on advocacy, um, on, 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 on strategies, um, building alliances with um, other um, victims communities, with other international groups, with um, um, other disciplines, not only lawyers, um, so, so to basically to build this um, pool alliances and a movement with with very different different roles. Um, each one can play in there um, globally, um, but again, at the forefront, um, those concerned um, should have the voice in, in 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 driving that and should have all the support. And then, when it comes to um, basically building the strategies, which is also process and would need a number of, um, of 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 meetings and and discussions, certainly as concerns all points so basically you know which trainings you you want to do depends on on where 
um, where you want to go and, and in terms of strategy, which, which documentation is important. If 10 groups document um, um, the human rights violations and no one documents command structures of the army or um, statements that could infer to the um, um, genocidal intent, then there would be a gap. So basically also in forms of documentation, um, you need to strategize already to, to see um, that not only um, what's happening on the ground and what um, victim survivors experience is documented, but also um, that there's a really good documentation in terms of um, responsibilities, not only state responsibilities, but also individual responsibilities. And to get to this point, um, again, one needs to think about building uh, alliances, how to get there. And um, so there are quite a number of, 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 of things um, that should be thought through um, and, and discussed um, over some time, um, basically to, to, to build strategies on, on justice and accountability. Another role could be the, also the one of um, economic financial actors who have uh, an interest in that, uh, which, which includes um, transnational corporations, and, and there's also a global perspective on, from, from that side, um, I think, that, that should be um, uh, looked into um, to have a, a, a comprehensive picture. Um, and then also, of course, in the um, overall context in which um, the crimes are taking place. So you still have a regime in power. So if you talk about international justice, it's often on regimes that are not in power anymore. But of course, there are more and more examples, um, not only Syria at the moment, but also in other countries where um, there's already a, a activities and a response, even if, if perpetrators are still in power. Um, but but it's, that's the context you need to know when strategize, and it's always difficult to compare situations because um, they are all, all so different, but on the other hand, you can also learn from other um, contexts. Um, so another point is um, um, double standards in international justice. So you, uh, there's a call to the international community, but on the, on, and, and, and um, European states, um, Northern American states, um, but it's also important to know, you know, how they use basically international justice, and um, that on on their um, crimes, like on, on on drone strikes and and and, and other situations, um, they're also not so strong on, on international justice issues. So it, it's it's necessary to know this context. Um, to, to, uh, in, in which you're acting, and that could also be a reason why other states, um, Russia, China, or also in the region in Southeast Asia, are reluctant to um, fully um, 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 support international justice. So that's another thing in terms of forming alliances, um, how to um, build strategies in, in this global context. Um, and, and of course, then there's a time factor in many situations when it comes to international justice. We saw that the time factor was also crucial in um, achieving some uh, changes. Uh, that means uh, um, other political circumstances, geopolitically, regionally, um, locally. It means um, more evidence might come up because also insider witnesses might speak up, and not now, but, but, but in, in, in a certain moment. Um, so so uh, the time factor is something um, you can influence, and, but you also should uh, take into account when, when strategizing and, and trying to reach um, the goals. So these are a few points I wanted to address here to bring into the discussion. Um, thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, I have to throw light on the issue, what can be done. And uh, here again, uh, we are in a very dark scenario. We do not see any immediate possibility. We know what should be done, but the basic question is how it can be done. Uh, I also do not have any ready-made answer, but uh, as before, we fall back to our own history in 1971. We were in a much, much more difficult scenario. There was no international criminal court, no hybrid court, no legal instrument, and the whole issue of the struggle of Bangladesh was very much opposed by the major powers of the world. And the United Nations would not recognize genocide. That was not even on the table. 
but they will look into it that this is a uh, conflict within a country and outside interference should not be there. So India should refrain from helping the liberation fighters. And in the even General Assembly Security Council, the discussion was on the political aspects. Never it addressed the issue of the, the refugee issue came up, but why so many refugees left their country? Why one in every seven or eight people had to leave the country? It was not in the and not in any discussion. But the whole scenario was, could be changed, and it was changed by the people's struggle. It is the people's voice, the solidarity movement all over the world, and I think that actually made it possible that Bangladesh emerged, and the issue of justice and end of impunity, we had to continue another struggle, but uh, this is the most important aspects, and I think when we do not see any light at the end of the tunnel, we can believe in ourselves that it is possible to do it. And it is the people's movement, which in 1960s, it had a strong uh, resonance because of the anti-war rallies and anti-Vietnam war, uh, the students movement, the 1968 students uprising. So in 1971, the global community stood for the cause of the Bengali people, for their persecution, for their suffering. And it is the artists and the singers and the poets who actually made the difference and also the younger generation. We live in a different scenario, but we see horrific atrocities. The world knows about it, but only knows through few stories or few research works or the journalistic uh, reporting. But those who have been to the camps, they came back with a completely different person. And we also found it with our work with the, in the camps. So it is very important that, uh, that we inspire the artist. We inspire the, uh, those who can make an artistic rendition of the suffering. That carries much more power than the discussions is important. But this is, I think, something which is now lacking. Let the Rohingya stories come up in a more and more powerful way, because it is a story that is needed to be told. And another thing, it came up that there should be Rohingya voice. And it is also a very difficult challenge. When our people went to the camps, they found that camps are mostly, there are no young people. And there are older people, but there are no educated Rohingyas. They have been denied their chance to get a proper education. And only those who have the religious education, they are, can actually do some kind of articulated renderation. And they call them, those people, as elemdar. Elemdar is an Arabic word, which means the learned one. And, but even the common people, even the women, even the uh, children, they have their own voice. So how to read the voice, how to read the silence, how to bring up that voice, that's also a very important challenge. And also to bring the Rohingyas in the different forums, to get them interacted with the with the global community who are standing in support of the cause, we can think of this way. And uh, there are many different ways, but we can make the difference. And the difference was made in 1971. And uh, the, another important aspect is collecting our testimony. We all have uh, learned what Karen has made the presentation, that how the testimonies has created a very strong force and it is very important that collection of testimonies can be coordinated, can be made a kind of network of those who are engaged in it. There are many different organizations engaged and doing this very important work. And uh, so testimonies are very important. And there is uh, one idea that we are playing with and we would like to share with you that uh, the refugee camps, as camps, they are the conditions are not very conducive. It is very difficult to provide support for such a large number of people. But there has been a uh, listing of the refugees. They have been issued card. There is discussion going on on the uh, repatriation or going back to their own land, uh, safe return, and all these things. But along with that, Myanmar side has raised a point that they want the cards to be organized on the family basis. And we think that this has created an opportunity because uh, the government has engaged, they are, the army is working on it, they, are, they have the infrastructure, they can make the cards on the basis of the family. 
And if we can create a kind of uh, 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 testimony or kind of a questionnaire which every family will fill in when they prepare their card, then we can actually know about the extent of atrocities. And we can have the stories from one million uh, uh, refugees who are taking shelter in Bangladesh. It will be a one million testimony. It will be one million evidence. And it, it can be done in such a way, in a very simple way, but it can be used as an evidence of the extent of suffering and the, uh, the intent, the uh, attacking of the civilian population, and how they lost their family, how they uh, suffered through the death trail or the refugee trail, why they were wiped out of the land, what was their life there, and what was the denial. So I think this huge documentation, we are discussing with International Council of Archivists. They have a human rights chair with Trudy Peterson, who worked in Guatemala with other places. So we can think of uh, creating an international network which will actually do the documentation. And this will be the first time that such massive documentation where nobody will be left out. So the extent of atrocities are large, and the documentation should be as large as the extent of atrocities. And we think that we can explore with these ideas and create a kind of a network, and we can address this uh, scenario. And I think uh, David Sheffer, Ambassador David Sheffer, has raised many interesting points. And the human rights, the chairman of Bangladesh National Human Rights Commission has also raised this issue that Bangladesh should go to the ICJ. And to go to the ICJ, the legal aspects and other things have been explained here, but it needs a lot of support from the global community. To go to the ICJ or to look into the option for International Criminal Court, Bangladesh government cannot do it on its own if there is not a strong civil, civil voice that this is the way this should be done, and the end of impunity is very much possible to establish. Maybe it will take time, but in case of Myanmar genocide, it should not take much time. So there are these possibilities. And here also we look back into uh, what happened in 1971 with the global solidarity movement. Many young people engaged in this, and there were a lot of people who came to the refugee camps, like what we see today in Cox's Bazar, in Kutupalong, that many people from different parts of the world coming on their own, going to the camps, collecting testimonies. And this has actually a very different phenomena that we are witnessing, and we are thankful to everybody, and we think that we can create also a kind of solidarity based on this uh, work that the, the people from many different countries are engaged in. And here we will refer to one incident during the Solidarity Movement of 1971. There was a uh, Action Bangladesh, was a great network formed by the British and the other uh, young people along with the Bangladeshi citizens. And they created a appeal that we will be engaged in Operation Omega. They said that when humanity is in distress, we do not recognize the border. We do not recognize the state. And the humanity is one, and let's create a single humanity. Let's uh, do it in such a way, generate the heat that uh, it reached to the omega point, when all the metals joined together and became a single alloy. So that is the Operation Omega. They came with this appeal. They raised some fund to buy ambulance. They drove it to the border. And they entered into Bangladesh, because they don't recognize Pakistan. And they were put in jail. So that's another story, but this is the solidarity movement with what can be done uh, also now with the Rohingya issue, which is a global issue, which is a crime against humanity, and which is a genocide, and everybody has a responsibility in that. And while studying the Rohingya issue, I find that it has a unique characteristic. When we look into the definition of genocide, it is clearly said the intent, which is uh, very debatable, but it is very clearly expressed by the Myanmar military and the operation they have done, intent to destroy either in whole or in partially, or in part, members of a group, the four protected groups, ethnic, racial, national, and religious. This is one case of genocide where it is not partial. It is the whole. There never happened like this, that the whole population has been attacked and whole population has been wiped out of their land. So this 
should become a clarion call for the global community and to get into the action. And it is the people's voice which can make the difference and which will be reflected in any many other way and also led to the end of impunity, establishment of justice and the right of the Rohingya people to have a safe return into their own land. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Zani and all the uh, organizers of this conference. I think it is very timely, and I believe this is the first step in our solidarity to work with the Rohingya people. Secondly, like Zani, uh, I would like to apologize to the Rohingya people. I'm not a Bama. I'm not a Buddhist. I belong to the Shan minority, and I'm a Christian. But my father and Aung San Suu Kyi's father tried to create a new nation. They agreed in 1947 to form a nation that is multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-religious. Uh, but they failed. Aung San himself was assassinated. And some years, 10 or so years later, my father also was arrested and died in prison. So I apologize that my father's efforts didn't work out. Secondly, I'd like to apologize personally because I have been engaged with the Rohingya people since 2000. My hope was to prevent something like what happened, the genocide. But again, I failed. And I had thought that with the transition government in 2010 and the peace talks with the different ethnic nationalities, we could somehow prevent uh, the use of violence and somehow eventually bring in the Rohingya people into the peace process. But that did not work out. Last June, my visa to Myanmar was denied. So I have not been able to go back. But what I want to say is that <clears throat> you know, we've been asking questions, what can we do? I think the first thing we have to do, like Zani pointed out just now to David Sheffer, we have to name what is happening a genocide. It is not ethnic cleansing. It is definitely genocide. And we need to get... We need to get all the governments to recognize this. We have to work towards that. Why? If you listen to the leaders of Myanmar today talking about what happened to the Rohingya, about what their intent is, it is very clear. They don't want them. They want them out of the country. Whether it is military officials, party officials, government officials, they all say they don't belong here. And they also, some of them also say, don't bring them back. So, you know, from all those, this, this, this is not made up. It is in public they are saying these things. So it's very clear the intention was to get rid of them. And so definitely it is a genocide. On top of that, the evidence that we have today is overwhelming. It's also very timely, and it's very substantive. You can actually see what's happening. This evidence is much more than what we had uh, when we were trying to change the regime, the military regime in Burma. At that time, the evidence we presented was accepted by the international community that what was happening in Myanmar was a massive repression of the people uh, and that the military government needed to be sanctioned. When we have so much more evidence, why is nothing happening? That, that is a, a, a very, um, it's a question, why? Because definitely, we, everybody can see what's happening. The military, is con the military and the government are continuing to deny what happened. They're saying, 
no atrocities were committed. The soldiers acted according to rules. There was nothing wrong. Um, it's just not acceptable. So what can we do about this? Well, I would like to say that when we started the democracy movement in Burma in 1988, I mean, we started before, but the massive movement started in 88, there was no hope of changing the regime. There was no hope of democracy in Burma, but we succeeded. The military stepped back, and Aung San Suu Kyi was placed in power. We, was, we were hoping that she would be the person to really democratize Burma. But what I'm trying to say is that the international community, the Burmese people, everybody worked together. Today we can work together. The Rohingyas, the non-Rohingyas from Burma, the international community, we can succeed. I'm very um, certain about that. So like I said, today is a very good start. And from today onwards, we really need to work on this issue. And the first thing is protection. Protection for the Rohingyas in Myanmar and those who are in the refugee camps. So the question is, how do we protect the, we, the Rohingyas in Myanmar? The government has said they have stopped clearance operation, but atrocities are continuing. Uh, none of the governments are willing to do anything. Is there anything more that we can do? That is something um, we should discuss. And I believe there are ways to try to uh, protect the Rohingya people in Myanmar. And secondly, how do we protect the people outside? And as was mentioned, the call for a protected repatriation to a protected homeland is something that really needs to be pushed. Because unless, I don't want to discuss going to a third country, because if you do that, the intention would have been successful. They would have got rid of the Rohingya community. So you should not do that. They should go back. But where do they go back to? That is the question. Uh, who will protect them? How will they be secure? And that is something that we really need to work on. And I think it's crucial that we work on it now. Don't talk about repatriation. What we need is a protection for both the Rohingyas inside and outside the country, and how can they return in safety? It doesn't matter what uh, mechanism or what instruments are used. We really need to consider different options. Taking the perpetrators to court definitely needs to be done, but that is not a short-term uh, solution. It is a lot of work, and it can be done. Uh, and I believe it will succeed, but it will take years. Uh, so immediate thing is I really think, make sure that it is recognized as genocide. And secondly, how, let's work on how we can protect the Rohingyas both inside and outside the country. And in the long term, starting now, we have not achieved democracy in Burma. If it was a democratic society, we would not have a genocide. So this is proof that we have not succeeded in democratizing the country. So we need to redouble our efforts to democratize Burma. And for those people who say we cannot do anything with, uh, uh, with Burma because Aung San Suu Kyi is there, and if we do anything, the democratization process, which is fragile, will fail. Well, I like to tell you that the longer she stays in power, the longer the military is protected, and the longer you don't have democratization in Burma. We need to democratize Burma. We need to support civil society in Burma and the younger generations. There are people in Myanmar who actually don't agree with what is happening. At the moment, the numbers are small, and they are, some of them are still scared, it was the same as we, we had to start before the military change. We worked before, 
and we were able to change the situation. I'm very confident we can do that again. Thank you for your support. <clears throat> So um, we have about um, 18 minutes or so. Um, what I want to do is um, give uh, the, you know, the panel another chance to respond to uh, uh, two specific questions and then open the uh, um, discussion to the floor. Um, one is the, um, my um, observation that um, conscience has been mobilized. And we, you know, we have less than six Rohingyas in this room. What that means is there are non-Rohingya consciences in this room. We have, in fact, increasingly become a threat to the Burmese genocidal regime by the mere fact that they felt a need to respond specific, specifically to today's event. So that means that we are not powerless. The conscience is power. How do we expand this pool of consciences? How do we mobilize a conscience? So my question is, um, one is the, um, what do we do with people whose conscience have been awakened? In what forms? Do we ask them to write checks to um, the human rights NGOs and humanitarian NGOs? Or do we ask them to, to, to form a, a global egalitarian, loose networks of activists who will bear pressure on their own democratic regimes to shape the domestic policies and bilateral relations and uh, multilateral relations with Burma? And secondly, do you think you know, the, the, there is a role for nation states you know, that can join hands with the um, citizens like ourselves? And if so, how that collaboration will look like? Is it in the form of uh, you know, the, civil, uh, the civil society, state uh, forums, where we will specifically redefine what is presented as solution, as you know, repatriation versus protected repatriation to a protected homeland. So, like, you know, any, any one of you um, here um, uh, th th should, uh, if you'd like to comment, please do so. Um, testing one, two, three. Yeah, I think I'm on. Um, I, I, th I think there's a couple things to do in the short term. Um, what to do to increase awareness. I think everyone that here today um, had an impact. <laughs> The government in Myanmar is aware of it. They trotted out their people to try to, to say that, you know, they didn't invite us, so that's the real story. It's not going to work. I've already shared that tweet with journalists in Canada, and they're going to write some stories tomorrow. So getting the word out to the wider public is very, very important. Um, there's another thing, though, is that how do you tell the story about of the what's happening to the Rohingya? What's happening in Myanmar? How do you tell that story? And I think a lot of people don't know. So I've had some talks in Canada about trying to see, can we make a documentary film interviewing the Nobel Peace Prize winners? It's an idea I would love to find out. If you know anyone or foundations that would love to fund something like this, I would love to take it to another discussion. But we have to start thinking about getting in the public imagination at the global level. That's, that's important. Um, the other thing I would say is that my institute um, is a partner of something called uh, GAMAC, the Global Action Against Mass Atrocity Crimes Initiative. Um, I believe our colleague from Bangladesh, his foundation, his group is also part of that. Parliament for Global Action are part of that. They're having their next meeting. It's going to be held in Uganda in, in, in uh, late May. That could be a, an amazing venue. It's funded by seven or eight states and it's going to have a whole collection of the top genocide prevention experts and human rights activists. So, so that could be another area to aim for and collaborate for in the future. Okay, thank you, Dr. Zani, for uh, raising these two important questions. First of all, to, uh, to realistically, what we need now to, uh, to bring all the awakened conscience into one platform, like in a form of, uh, like uh, we, can say, we can call it free Rohingya coalitions. So this, this is really important to be formed, uh, to bring all the conscience, all the supporters into one platform that give voices, that give pressure to the nation states, and that, that, that harness all the energy so that this genocide is stopped and Rohingya get uh, the peace in their homeland. 
and like for example BDS movement in 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 uh, in, uh, in uh, the Israel that give pressure to Israeli uh, uh, repression on uh, pal Palestinian. So this is very important to for, to be formed. We hope uh, the we will uh, we will we can I implement this uh, free Rohingya coalition, coalition as soon as possible. And I want to uh, the uh, the a little bit uh, the uh, two important uh, points uh, regarding documentations. Myanmar government has been uh, the, the changing the names of the villages uh, of the Rakhine State. For example, uh, the, uh, the the my village where I was born is Arab Shafara in our Rohingya name Arab Shafara. The government has changed this name as Laboza. So it's real. and these changes has been occurring across that kind of state. So why this is important, I will tell you a little bit later. Another is, when uh, the, the Rohingya are uh, the registered in, uh, uh, the, in uh, registration, family registration booklet, they distort the Rohingya name. For example, my name, Rohingya name is Muhammad Khubaib. So, but in family list is Hobi, or something like that. Uh, Hobi, or uh, something uh, that pronounced that way. So, when these people came to Bangladesh, the Bangladeshi, Bangladeshi authority is registering the names and the villages. But the Rohingya, if Bangladeshi authority asks, what is your name? The, 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 the Rohingya would say, Muhammad Khubaib. But the name in the family list in, Bangla, in, in Myanmar site is Hobi. And the, what, which village you are from? I am from Arab Shafara because most of the Rohingya would call their, in Rohingya. But in Burmese the system, this is not, there is no Arab Shafara. So the Burmese government eventually will tell, this is not from our uh, in Rakhine state. This is very important for the documentation process. So uh, I would like to keep this in mind. Thank you. Well, I think especially in, in terms of organizing, it, it, it's and, 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 and how to also broaden the um, um, su su support, it's, I mean, there, <clears throat> I think there are many issues um, at stake and many different perspectives to it. So, um, and I think quite a lot of them came um, up through, throughout this day, um, today. So uh, I think there's a really good collection of, of different matters um, at, at the end of the day, from protection to justice and accountability to, um, um, what name it, discrimination, many other things, documentation and so on. So. Um, so one thing is to have um, 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 a certain focus and expertise in, in any of them, but probably different actors and groups and, and their alliances, but then also not to miss the, the broader context and picture um, overall um, in conferences like that one where, where all these perspectives are brought together. And the same goes with alliances uh, also internationally, regionally, um, same on, on those aspects um, um, to form that and so so everyone in terms of uh, own conscience and, and solidarity can bring in his or her own um, e experience, expertise, um, which is not for everything, but uh, you know, one group here, one group there. And, 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 and I think that needs to be also developed and, and can build on to have really um, um, expert knowledge somewhere. Um, then those working with communities to build that, to bring their voices out you mentioned with documentary or other other ways uh, certainly um, and, but also not to lose the, the overall picture so I think that's also the challenge but that's something that can be built uh, well I think uh, when the Myanmar junta they started the atrocities they had the idea that it will die out in two three months people will forget and uh, the the positive thing is uh, it has not been forgotten and it is more and more it is coming up in the public domain. And uh, we may feel very frustrated with what Security Council has done so far or in the UN General Assembly, but we must appreciate that the UN agencies, they have done a very solid work on the ground. The IOM, the UNHCR, or uh, UNDP and other organizations, they have came up with their own report, and those are really very uh, strong reports th that highlighted the atrocities and suffering. And also the special report here, we have listened to Yang Li, how she reacted and also uh, uh, how she reacted when she visited the camps. And But one major area where is the place of occurrence inside Myanmar, where nobody has any access, 
And I think this, in this, we should start. Uh, we should think very strongly that how we can take the stories out of the the places of occurrence and the real story, the real suffering. We have some films, some shorts, stray shorts, and also some reporters who have risked their life and try to depict that. So this is a very important aspect. And uh, also the even a special report here to deal with the sexual violence, Pramila Patton. She is also very committed with this. And uh, I think in end March, she would make a submission at the even Human Rights Council in Geneva. Even Human Rights Council is also another important forum where these things should be very strongly promoted. And civil society has a role to play in this respect. And uh, Adama Dieng, even a special report here for the prevention of genocide, they have issued a statement. And also, he is coming to Bangladesh in mid middle of March and will visit the camps. Uh, then we have this alliance, global alliance against mass atrocity crime, where we are also part of this uh, founder members, and we will look into these forums. There are many other international forums, networks, many universities which are engaged in different kind of genocide studies and research. So um, let the Rohingya crisis come up more and more into the focus, be subject of a study, and also the documentation, the testimonies, and the human aspects of the story, how strongly we can promote that to the larger audience is very important. And I think uh, we all together can change the scenario. We do not know how it will happen, but I have a hitch that maybe in today or tomorrow, the state regime will also crack up because there are signs of that. It is not so uh, easy that you do such atrocity and you do not have within your, your uh, um, forum or your uh, party or your followers, the same obligation. So uh, we have seen that ASEAN as a majority Muslim Buddhist country, but in ASEAN also the Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, they are raising their own voice and ASEAN Human Rights Forum has taken a different stand than the ASEAN states. Japan is also in a dilemma. Uh, officially they have taken a position, but behind the scene they are trying to do something more concrete. So there are there are many things happening around, and I think this was possible because the international community, especially the civil society, has never allowed the Rohingya crisis to go out of focus, and that's very important. Um, in terms of protecting Rohingyas inside the country, I won't, don't want to discuss it in public. But those who are interested, maybe we can discuss it later. In terms of our work, I agree that we need a whole coalition of people. But from experience, I would like to say that it's very difficult to form a formal coalition because some people are from institutions, some people are from NGOs, some people are just activists. So you know, to try to get everybody in one organization is not possible. But we need to be all coordinated. We all need to be working together. So I would think more of a loose network. And you could have a network of people working on human rights, a network of people working on the legal aspect of things, a network of people working on humanitarian access, documentation, all sorts of things. But um, one of the things we, we found with the Burma campaign we worked with in the past was that each country really forms its own, forms its own support group for the Rohingya people. They work together, they, they network, and they all do their own thing. But legally, they're not bound together. So that, that would be the model I would look at because it has worked in the past because each country is different. Like in Germany, for example, we worked with different stiftungs, but the stiftungs could not work together <laughs> because they are from different parties. You know? But in other countries, we could work with uh, different groups, different parties. Uh, we could have cross-party uh, groups. So I would say don't restrict it. Let each country develop. But they, first of all, everybody needs to be aware. The awareness campaign is very important. 
What we used to do is that we would go to all the countries, have an awareness, then you create interest and people who come to those meetings then say, we want to work on Burma, we want to, you know. So I think that would work. Um, I'm gonna open this up to the floor. Uh, yeah, we've got three microphones I can share. I live in a college town because that's where I want to be. And the University of Colorado in Boulder, the mother campus, each year holds its Conference on World Affairs, CWA. It was started 70 years ago, the same year Burma got independence. They have a crazy policy that none of the people who live in Boulder can be speakers, but they can be moderators. I was asked to do that once more many years ago. I don't mean you remember. So if any of you have any links, or even if you want to write a letter to the Conference on World Affairs, if you want to go email it, go ahead and do it. I have bugged them so many times, they're getting tired of me. One year, this a new guy came on board and he didn't know where I lived. So he asked me whether he could see me. Well, I, he never followed up, but I think he found out that I live right there in Boulder. Anyway, Conference on World Affairs is a good forum. At one of those meetings, at one of those conferences, Rachel Maddow, do you know her? MSNBC? A very, very sharp gal, a Rhodes Scholar at one time. She was on the desk and I approached her to say something to her because in her resume she said she is damn good at making pigu cocktails. I said, Rachel, that's a dirty word. When I approached her, she stood up and shook my hands. Not many people do that when they, come, when they see me coming. Anyway, I told Rachel what the PQ Club meant. I said, the PQ Club was a racist enclave of the British when they were ruling Burma. And I said, stop using that. That's a dirty word. Your cocktail will taste a lot better if you don't call it PQ Club. Anyway, Conference on World Affairs, whoever can. Zani is a good guy. We've been together when we were doing Free Burma Coalition. You got all those guys. Get them back again. Sigourney Weaver and Ma Ma Madonna. I don't care who you do it. <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm um, his better half. <laughs> and uh, Indeed, I consider myself a little bit better than him because I listen rather than talk. But this time I do want to talk. The main problem with Burma, the way I see it, is not, the, not only the uh, genocide that's happening now, but the fact that Burma is ruled by the military. A long time ago, Eisenhower said, beware of the military industrial complex. So Burma, all the natural resources of Burma is in the hands of the military. And um, indeed, at one time we had sanction, but um, China came in and bought the timber, the oil, and most of the natural resources from Burma, including the uh, precious stones like jade and uh, the other things. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that uh, we have to deal or we have to uh, kind of uh, suppress the military in Burma. They have not only uh, done wrong to the ethnic people in Burma. The Shans suffered, the Moons suffered, the Karens suffered, and uh, now the Rohingyas. It's all because of the military. So I would suggest that uh, whoever is interested in um, uh, resolving the problem of the Rohingyas to follow the money, where does the money go to? And m most of the uh, things right now goes to the military. I saw 
dates and the size of the table. It's in the military hands and everything else. And uh, so, uh, Zani, if you could follow the money, where does the money go to? We, we were in Burma about uh, a year ago. Nearly everything from the hotels to the restaurants to the schools are all in the hands of the military. And um, uh, so this has to be uh, exposed. The military, the generals are the ones that are rich now. And it is also true, the main reason that the Rohingyas are ousted from the land because there's titanium there. And it is a good source of natural resources, a good source of money for the military. So indeed the Rohingyas suffered, but so did the other. Even the Burmans suffered. I want you to know, and I think Zani knows that, quite a few Burmans were put in jail in addition to the Shans. And indeed, I'm still being very sad at the fact that Han's father was killed by the military. Unu was uh, uh, suffered a long time by the military. So let's concentrate on the fact that the military is the source of all the problems. And not only in Burma, the military in other countries too. So indeed, if, if it is possible, I want somebody to um, get to the power and the monies that the military uh, gets. Thank you. Um, okay, um, I'm gonna give um, Kohan the <clears throat> last word, and then uh, we're gonna close the session and then invite um, Professor Spiebuck and uh, Professor Maria. Um, for the last uh, keynote uh, address. All right. Thank you. I f forgot to mention something really important and Riri reminded me of it. And that is the fact that both the Bama majority and the Buddhists in Myanmar are being used by the military. Because the military actually is trying to build, they are hated by the normal population, but they have used this Rohingya um, situation a genocide, and said this is a terrorist attack from the Islamists. So we are protecting the country. And so the people have rallied behind the military. And th this is very important to know because this whole ideology started with even before Ne Win, started in the 1930s, and it is, as Sani mentioned, very much based on the idea of a a pure race, uh, and that is why they, they are trying to get rid of the Rohingyas. But it is not only the Rohingyas. The Rohingyas are the first mass victim that we see very clearly. It has been happening in other ethnic areas. If they succeed with this genocide and nobody reacts, who knows who will be the next? Now, any troublesome ethnic group that is fighting them, there are still groups fighting them, could easily become the next target. And they are already trying to brand the groups that are not signing the ceasefires as terrorist groups, like they have branded the Rohingya group. So I really want to warn the different ethnic people in Myanmar, this is not a Rohingya issue. It is a national issue, and you will be the next target. 